Hello everyone, Kibler here with the latest in my video series about Duelist produced in partnership with Counterplay Games. Today we're going to take a look at the new cards from the Rise of the Bloodborne expansion. I actually have not yet had a chance to uh, play with the cards, but uh, I'm excited to get into them and I wanted to share my sort of initial thoughts uh, before actually making any decks using these cards just yet. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right in, starting with the Lionar cards. Now, Lionar is the faction that I play pretty much by far the most. Uh, I'm a big fan in particular of Helenar decks, uh, which those of you who watch my channel a lot uh, probably know by now. But, and there's a lot of cool tools for Lionar in this set, so let's just get going. Uh, first up is Draining Wave. This is an interesting card because it is a very powerful removal effect. It uh, costs just one and deals four damage, but it also deals damage to your general. Uh, this is, on the one hand, a drawback because, hey, you're taking damage for playing your removal, but on the other hand, it can help turn on uh, some of your, your cards that rely on healing in order to be effective. Uh, it gives you more value out of things that heal your general than you otherwise might have. One of the things that Lionar can struggle with is this kind of efficient removal uh, that doesn't necessarily require them to have uh, units in play in order to actually you know, kill their opponent's stuff. And Draining Wave, I think, is potentially a powerful tool in that arsenal that allows you to be uh, more efficient. Uh, I played a number of uh, heal in our decks that use like Solarius, for instance, and one of the issues is that sometimes you just get a hand just kind of glutted full of cards and you can't really afford to play all of them. You don't have enough crystals. Uh, but Draining Wave being so efficient and allowing you to, to make use of uh, your healing very effectively, I think might find a home in that style of deck. So this is a card that I'm excited about trying out. Uh, I don't know that it's gonna be a superstar, but it definitely could uh, find a home in the right deck. Next up, we have Prism Barrier, which gives a friendly minion force field. Uh, this is kind of an interesting card. It feels a little bit out of place to me in Lionar, not thematically, but in terms of what the uh, the faction wants out of its out of its minions. Uh, this feels like it might go in, say, an Argian deck that's looking to be aggressive and pump up an individual minion, and you can you know potentially give it a force field and attack it into your opponent's stuff and you know basically value trade your opponent all day. It's a very powerful effect, prevent all damage to the thing this turn to begin with, and then it still retains the force field ability uh, for future turns. That said, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily going to be as powerful as something that actually just pumps the attack of the minion. I don't think that this could really see play in a Xeron deck, for instance. It really needs to be in, in a deck uh, that has the ability to pump that minion itself, and I think that Ar Argeon may be a, a strong home for this if there's really room for it. The problem is that this is the sort of card that if you're playing an aggressive deck, it's kind of tricky to figure out a way to fit it in there. You know, you might you probably want to be like an Argian mid-range style deck that might be able to find a use for this. But uh, not a card that really stands out to me as something that's going to make a real splash immediately, uh, but could be a, a strong contender kind of in a niche situation. Next up, we have Scintilla. And this is a reasonably statted body. You know, it's a 3-4-4-3, three, four, four, three, which is already pretty solid. Uh, and then Blood Surge, which is the new mechanic of the expansion. Uh, blood Surge being whenever you use your Bloodborne spell, you gain this additional effect. And this restores three health to your general. So this is obviously a card that could fit into those uh, healing decks. could also be a card that fits into a more aggressive style of deck because uh, you can potentially try use this in an Argian deck, for instance, to have a body that's totally reasonable on its own that also helps you just go aggressive with your general and trade very effectively and uh, just have tools against aggressive decks uh, that don't really cost you a ton uh, in terms of the way that you're actually building your deck. You're not playing, you know, cards that are costed poorly in terms of their stats, and you're just getting a little bit of extra value out of your Bloodborne spell you and use it. So I think this actually could go into either style of general for Lionar and has some powerful options in either, either deck. So uh, this is a card that I definitely am looking forward to trying out. Uh, I think this at its best in a Xeron deck where you can make use of the double trigger from your... Uh, effects that care about healing, uh, and it's also just a reasonable body that you can play early in the game too, so I definitely have a card that has potential that I'm looking to try. Uh, next up we have Sunbreaker. Uh, this is a 2-4 four for 4 with Force Field that makes your Bloodborne spell into Tempest, which is deal 2 damage to all minions and generals. This is a weird card, because I can't think of a deck that really wants this proactively. It's not like you're playing a Sunbreaker in a deck and it's like, you know, you're really happy about doing two damage to everything. Tempest isn't a card that you really build your deck around. It's a it's a card that you put into your deck because of what you expect to play against. So Sunbreaker feels like a metagame call to me in the instance that you 
basically want to be playing a deck with more Tempest than you're allowed to play. Or, you know, you want to play something that uh, is a little bit higher impact than Tempest in itself, which Sunbreaker clearly is in the right circumstances. If you're playing against, say, uh, Abyssian, Abyssian Swarm decks, or any kind of Swarm decks for that matter, where Tempest is very powerful, you could have some number of Sunbreakers in addition to the copies of Tempest that you play to give you access to that effect more often. So more of a metagame call than something that I think that you actually build a deck around. Next up, we have Trinity Oath, which is draw three cards and restore three health to your general for four. And this is a very powerful card. Uh, this is a card that I think can fit into really any style of, uh, of Lion or deck that is looking to play any kind of mid-range to controlling type of game. Uh, it's obviously particularly powerful if you are getting additional effects from that healing. Um, but uh, I played a lot of very attrition-oriented Lionar heal decks, and I've played Sworn Sister in those decks, I've played Solarius in those decks, various things to just give me the ability to kind of eke out advantages over my opponent. Uh, and Trinity Oath is not obviously as powerful on the board as Sworn Sister, but Sworn Sister, you know, is a 2-4-4, four, four, four. it's not really super exciting. And uh, Trinity Oath can actually get you the cards that are in your deck, as opposed to... Uh, you know, cards from outside the game. There's some value to that because you can get access to effects that you don't already have, uh, which can give you some flexibility, but Trinity Oath allows your deck to more consistently do what you want it to do and dig to, you know, the removal spells or the dispels or whatever else, the finishers that you know are in your deck. So uh, this can give a lot of consistency and and uh, long game power to Lionheart decks and expect this to be a really important card in uh, those decks moving forward. Lastly in Lionheart, we have Excelsius. This is a card that I want to be excited about. This is a card that, you know, it's a huge finisher for a heal in our deck. You know, if you uh, have procced this, you know, five times, ten times, it's a huge minion late in the game. The problem is that it's still just a big minion that can either get killed or get dispelled. The fact that so much of the power of this card lies in its abilities means that it's so vulnerable to dispel effects that I don't really know that you can really justify playing it. Maybe you play like one copy in you know your, your heal in our deck that you can dig through, eventually find with Trinity Oath or Solarius or whatever. It could be this big you know late game way to, to end the game, uh, but it's not really all that exciting in large part just because there are so many silences around, there's so many ways to dispel uh, your, your opponent's minions, and it can just get totally neutered by any one of those effects. And... You know, in many cases, I found you're better off just trying to run your opponent out of stuff than have a big finisher like this. You don't need the the big thing. You know, that was actually one of the things that I found I was having the most success with when I moved away from having, you know, something, some individual large threat to end the game and more just I have a bunch of mid-range threats, but I have a bunch of ways to draw cards and eventually you're going to be out of resources and I'm going to have some left. And having a card like Excelsius, you know, in your hand early in the game, obviously you can replace it. So there's not the threat of it just sitting there and rotting the entire game, uh, but it just isn't as effective as the uh, the other tools that you can have to run your opponent out and just keep you alive and eventually win. Uh, but you know some matchups, I'm sure, when people don't have that much in the, in terms of uh, dispel effects, Excelsius can be great. And uh, I definitely am looking forward to trying the card, but I'm not nearly as excited as I want to be about it. Next up, we have Songhai. Now, if uh, Lionar is my most played faction, this is probably my least played faction. So take all of my input on these cards with a little bit of a grain of salt. So Obscuring Blow gives a friendly minion or general backstab two. Uh, one thing that's worth noting, it's a one cost spell. And Songhai is a very spell heavy faction. And cheap spells in particular are powerful in Songhai because they uh, allow you to grow things like your chakra avatars and uh, trigger your forms magi and everything like that uh, and this is in itself you know obviously not a powerful card because it requires both a unit in play a minion in play and positioning the fact that it can affect your general is pretty powerful the fact that you know this is a one cost way to give your general backstab uh, is actually fairly strong it has kind of the ability to to uh, be either an artifact or a buff for a, uh, a minion, and that's a pretty powerful effect. So, you know, this is a card that doesn't jump off the page at me as being, you know, oh my god, this is super powerful. But the flexibility of it and uh, the low cost of it makes me think this is something we may see more of in the future. Next up, we have Ethereal Blades. This uh, two cost spell, again, spells are good in Songhai, cheap spells in particular, that gives a friendly minion and your general plus two attack. And now, if we just kind of do the math, if you have a minion, this is plus four 
which is four damage, which is more than, say, Phoenix Fire, which is obviously a very powerful card uh, in Songhai, sort of a staple in those decks. Uh, if you're playing a Songhai deck that can expect to have minions in play on a regular basis, uh, that can also expect for their general to be in range of being able to use uh, their attack effectively in any given turn, this is a very powerful potential card. Uh, if you're just rushing people down, if you're looking to burst people down sort of in a combo turn, this can be powerful in sort of both those uh, those arenas. So uh, I don't know that this is necessarily a card that can supplant a lot of these sort of positional tricks that you have or the card draw that you have or the burn that you have, but it can supplement them in some way. And uh, there's you know, a, a little bit of wiggle room in some of these sort of spell high or aggro song high hip decks. And I think that Ethereal Blades might be good enough to sort of squeak in uh, in those decks. Next up, we have Twilight Fox. It's a really weird card, the Songhai Legendary for the set, with 3-3 three, three for 3 with Blood Surge, transport a random enemy to the space behind your general. You can't just teleport someone in a place where you can just immediately backstab them, so unfortunate for that. But it can prevent people from running away from you uh, if you're looking to get in there and give them a beatdown. You know, if you're playing against, say, an Abyssian opponent who is trying to uh, build you know, a, a swarm of Wraithlings and keep you at bay, this can just be like, nope, sorry, you're over here. Or you're playing and say, Vath. And Vath's just trying to like duck and weave and stay away from you until he just comes up and punches you in the face for lethal. You can Twilight Fox, bring him right next to you, hit him with your general and whatever minions are near you. So I think this is a card that has some potential. Uh, if you're you know playing against uh, decks or there are strategies like say Vitruvian or whatever decks that are looking to blast you or whatever else, uh, it can be a tool that can give you sort of the positional advantage in those spots. And anything that can, you know, teleport you or your opponents can be pretty strong in Duelist because it is so powerfully positionally based. So much of the game is about positioning. And if you're able to disrupt your opponent's positioning with something uh, like Twilight Fox when uh, it's, you know, sort of a crucial moment in the game, it can be very effective. Next up we have Whiplash which is probably the best Songhai card in the set, just from my initial read of these. You know, it's a three cost, four, three, so okay stats, decent stats. We've seen, you know, cards with this, uh, this stat line see a reasonable amount of play. And then Blood Surge, deal two damage to the enemy general. So Songhai, in many cases, just looking to kill the opponent. You know, looking to assemble enough damage to finish the opponent off. And with Whiplash, you know, you can turn your Bloodborne spell into you know, teleport my guy or make it make a ranged guy plus two damage. And if your opponent doesn't kill your whiplash, that's every other turn and toward the end of the game, every single turn, you're just able to whittle them down. And, you know, that's really powerful effect uh, in a faction that's really just often looking to assemble exactly enough to finish the opponent off. So uh, this is my pick for the best Songhai card in the set and uh, perhaps one of the even best overall cards in the set in terms of the impact it will have in the metagame. Next up, we have Cobra Strike, uh, which is another just, you know, we're looking to do some damage. Uh, one of the, the things that Songhai can sometimes struggle with is having to choose between killing opposing minions to preserve its own minions or keep itself alive and killing the opponent. Well, with Cobra Strike, you don't have to choose. You can just do both. Um, you know, when you're, when you're looking to just, again, kind of like with, with Whiplash, you're looking to assemble enough damage to finish your opponent off, even though this is inefficient at killing an opposing minion. Obviously, the opposing minion that you're going to be killing at four, probably not going to be on curve of, you know, dying to three damage. But this can finish something off, this can kill something down curve, and just get a little bit of damage in your opponent. And all that damage really adds up, and that is uh, sort of the effect that you're getting out of Cobra Strike. So this is another card that I think might not read great at first, but I think has a lot of potential. You know, if, if you came from Magic the Gathering, for instance, uh, probably one of the most underrated cards when it came out that ultimately ended up being, you know, a staple not only in standard formats, but in, in eternal formats like Legacy or Modern uh, was Searing Blaze. And this obviously is less efficient than Searing Blaze, uh, but it is effectively the same thing in the kind of deck that wants that effect. So uh, I think this is kind of a sleeper in the set, and uh, I, I would expect to see this to at least see some play in aggressive song high decks. Next up, we have Geomancer. This is kind of with uh, with Quiplash, uh, one of the cards that you know messes with your uh, your Bloodborne spell. This actually is an opening gambit effect, so you just play this guy for the rest of the game. Your Bloodborne spell is Phoenix Fires. So if Whiplash is powerful for finishing your opponent off, Geomancer is even more so. The problem with Geomancer though is just its stats compared to its size. This is a five four for five, and that's 
pretty difficult to justify putting into an aggressive deck. Obviously, it can give you sort of long game potential of uh, having much more powerful Bloodborne spell, but you're making a much bigger sacrifice than you are with Whiplash, which is a card that is powerful in the early stages of the game, and then just remains powerful late because it adds its effect to your Bloodborne spell. Whereas Geomancer, you know, he is just kind of a dead card for the first, first uh, bunch of turns of the game, and then, you know, activates this powerful effect with your Bloodborne spell. So uh, I do think this is a card that could have some uh, some p potential viability, but it's not nearly as exciting uh, as Whiplash is to me. Uh, but I'm open to be proven wrong, because as I said, I don't really know that much about Songhai. Next up is Vitruvian. Uh, I've played a little bit more Vitruvian than I have of Songhai, but still not one of my most played factions. Uh, but I'll tell you what I can. With Stone to Spears, Friendly Obelisk gains plus three attack and may move and attack this turn able. Eh? You know, yes, it gives you some ability to move your Obelisks uh, out of positions that may no longer be particularly effective. They can you know, attack opposing, uh, opposing minions or even opposing generals. Uh, but... This is, you know, a, a card that's not going to really do much in most games. Maybe you're getting the ability to, you know, play an obelisk and kill an opposing guy early in the game. That's potentially pretty effective, but I think later on in most games, this is going to be largely a dead card, and that's a pretty big problem. So uh, it is worth noting this is especially good with Nimbus because the, uh, the obelisks that Nimbus creates all have the, if any creature damages this, kill them. So if you are playing a bunch of Nimbuses and you're able to get... I don't even remember. I think it's Soulburn Obelisks into play. Uh, if you Stone to Spears those, those are just kill a guy. So maybe there's some synergy there that's worth exploring. Uh, but overall, my uh, my guess is this isn't going to be a particularly effective card. It does cost one, so it d can give you, you know, a, a ability to interact fairly cheaply alongside other things you play in a turn. Uh, but I'm just not really sold on the overall effect. Next up, we have Zephyr, uh, which is a 3-3-3-3. Three, three for three. Blood Surge, your general gains Frenzy this turn. And uh, this is clearly kind of a Cyan Asajj type of card. And Saj actually has a lot of powerful things. You know, this, say, plus Falcius with, you know, use your Cyan Asajj ability. It's like, all right, well, just kill all your guys and take no damage. And that's pretty powerful. So I don't want to dismiss this because it doesn't really look super strong on the surface. Just, you know, 3 3 for 3, John Guy's Frenzy, eh. You know, but at the same time, I've seen the damage that Saj can do with her Bloodborne spell uh, and a couple of buffs. So uh, I think that Zephyr could have some potential in the right deck. Uh, next up we have Divine Spark, which is basically what Scion's second wish used to be. Draw two cards, except now for three mana. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Scion's second wish was kind of useless during the draw two cards phase of, of Duelist Existence. And then was just nuts when the uh, one card draw was implemented. So... Here we are in a sort of happy medium of uh, draw two cards being three mana. Uh, so this is definitely a card that uh, is valuable in a controlling style of Vitruvian deck. Uh, often, you know, you'll you'll want to find specific cards in your deck, uh, you know, rather than you know, say in the situation of Trinity Oath we were talking about earlier, you know, comparing that to Sworn Sister and wanting to get specific cards from your own deck rather than just general card advantage which you get from the Sworn Sister. This will dig you to find, you know, your your Whisper or your Star's Fury or whatever else, you know, the key cards that your deck is operating on. So uh, I think this will be a card that may even become a staple in in some sorts of Vitruvian decks uh, that are looking to play a longer game. So definitely going to see play moving forward. Next up we have Incinera, or Incinera, not really sure. 5-6 uh, five, for 5, reasonable stats, pretty solid. And uh, your general will move two additional spaces. And this... It's kind of an interesting card because it's like, why does Vitruvian have this like you know bonus movement thing? It's not really a thing of theirs, but Vitruvian has the most positionally restricted removal effects with you know Entropic Decay, Dominate Will, and now even Siphon Energy, requiring you to be next to something that you know in Cinera uh, will give you the ability to position yourself and get to what you need to. You know, there's so often I find myself you know my opponent just kind of puts a uh, a minion sort of kitty corner behind them that I can't move next to, so I can't kill it, and it's, you know, oh my god, this is this is destroying me. Well, with this, you can play it, run up, and kill their guy, or steal their guy, or whatever else. So I think this is a card that could end up seeing play. Uh, it's also obviously very good with a, uh, a Cyan Asajj deck uh, that's looking to get into position to actually use her melee attacks, whether you're using her with Falcius Zephyr, with Blast, with whatever else. Uh, can be very effective in, you know, allowing you to to position your general very well. So, as I mentioned previously, you know, the positioning is such a key element of Duelist that cards that allow you to significantly mix up 
your ability to maneuver, I think, can be quite powerful, and uh, this might be one of those. Next up, we have Autark's Gifts. Six cost, equip two random Vitruvian artifacts. Uh, this is, you know, from a, a uh, power level perspective, hard to kind of evaluate. You know, the, the Vitruvian artifacts are pretty good, but not all of them amazing. Is it worth, you know, paying six for two of them? Well, it depends what they are. You know, if you, if you get the uh, the really powerful ones that, like, say, uh, was it Hexblade? That if you kill a guy, it turns into a uh, an obelisk that kills your opponent slowly. That's really good. If you get two of those, oh, my God, you're, you're just blowing your opponent up. But, you know, some of them are not nearly as powerful. So, you know, maybe this is a uh, another card that goes into a, you know, artifact-heavy uh, Saj deck that's looking to you know just blow you know all the, all your opponent's stuff up in a single turn with blast whatever else just get more and more and more artifacts definitely a cool card that uh, I'm interested to explore uh, and uh, you know I don't think it's likely to be sort of a, a top tier competitive card at least not with the card pool we have right now uh, but it's certainly something that uh, inspires creativity and that's something I like to see next up we have Grandmaster Noshrak. A 4-7 flying blast for 7 when the enemy general takes double damage. This is a really interesting card because one of the things that can be kind of a problem, and this is something we talked about a little bit with Excelsius. You know, one of the problems with Excelsius, it's a card that, that if your opponent just immediately like dispels it, doesn't do anything. But with Grandmaster Noshrak, you can just play this and just kill your opponent because its ability that causes your opponent to take double damage immediately turns on. So if you are, you know, oh, I'm, I'm just, your opponent's like, oh, I'm, I'm safe. Uh, you know, my, my opponent only has 10 and I'm at 20. You're like, okay, Grandmaster, kill you. And that's pretty huge because having effectively an immediate game impact when a card is played is super important, especially for high cost minions. And yes, Excelsius has some because he has Provoke, but that's not necessarily as impactful because this, you know, is an effect that even if your opponent had a removal spell, even if your opponent had a dispel, it can just end the game on the spot. So I think this is, has the potential to be a very strong card, a very powerful finisher for uh, Vitruvian decks. And uh, you know, even outside of the ability to just kill your opponent, having Blast and Flying means this is a very strong removal uh, unit late in the game. So definitely excited to try this card out and I uh, think it has a lot of potential. Next up we have Abyssian. And uh, Abyssian has some kind of bizarre cards, but really cool cards in this set. Uh, first up we have Furosa. Not to be mistaken with Furiosa, who is not a tiny minion, but instead uh, a, you know, great warrior of the wastes in Mad Max. But anyway, Furiosa uh, gives Blood Surge. Uh, one cost, one, two. Blood Surge friendly rates and get plus one, plus one. So this gives you an additional effect. I assume you're going to be playing Lilith and not Kasivo when you're playing Furiosa uh, of spawning some Wraithlings and buffing them. And that's pretty strong if you're playing a deck that's looking to make a lot of Wraithlings. We haven't seen a lot of success of those decks necessarily in recent uh, recent time. And this is a card that can just attach that uh, Wraithling buff to your Bloodborne spell. You don't have to necessarily have an additional card. Obviously, Furosa is kind of an additional card. But Furosa can obviously also stay in play and give you this effect repeatedly if your opponent doesn't remove it. So definitely has some potential in a Wraithling Swarm deck that uh, I'd like to see uh, and potentially experiment with. Okay, next up we have Aphotic Drain, two-cost spell. Destroy a friendly minion to restore five health to your general. Uh, this is kind of a weird card. Uh, it is definitely a very powerful life gain effect, in particular in a Lilith deck that is making Wraithlings, so it has expendable stuff, uh, or has, you know, whatever of the uh, the Undying-style Sarlacc-type type minions. Uh, so if you're playing against a, uh, you know, aggressive styles of decks that are looking to burn you out, this is one of the most efficient life gain effects that you can have. So it definitely has a role in that case. Not really a card that you play sort of in a vacuum. It's not like you're using your health as a resource when you're playing Abyssian. Uh, but I could definitely see if, if uh, those burn Songhai decks we were talking about earlier become popular, this is a great counter to them that you could potentially use in your deck. Uh, next up we have Punish, which is just two cost, destroy damage minion. And it is so weird to me that this is a card that hasn't existed before in Duelist. It seems like it's such a basic type of effect that you would have imagined. It wouldn't be part of you know the second expansion, but here he is. You know, here we have Punish. Uh, in Abyssian. Abyssian seems like a kind of interesting place for it. Uh, it's very powerful with the Kasiva Bloodborne spell because you can use your Bloodborne spell and then punish any minion and kill it, which is super efficient in terms of uh, in terms of removal effects. So this, I think, is a very, very strong card for Kasiva, uh, any type of deck, really. Mid-range, control, whatever. Just effectively having kill a minion as long as your Bloodborne spell is active 
uh, for for total of three mana. Kind of nuts. So uh, I think this is going to be a very powerful card that will potentially even uh, catapult those decks to, to much higher tiers of effectiveness. Next up we have Horror Burster. A three cost 4-1 with Dying Wish. Turns from a random friendly minion to a 6-6 Horror. So this is potentially another card that can go into those Swarm decks. The key here with Horror Burster is ensuring that you have a significant number of minions so your opponent can't kill this when you have no other minions. So you need to be able to ensure that you get this trigger on something when it does die. It's obviously very easy for your opponent to kill. So you want to play this in a deck that can make a bunch of guys. So Wraithling Swarm style of deck. I think this is potentially a card that could have a home there. It is really easy to kill and will die to like a Tempest along with everything else. So maybe you want to have, you know, some uh, some things that, that are much harder to kill. I'm not really sure how this would work. If this, if this died, for instance, along with a Sarlacc, if this would transform the Sarlacc potentially. But uh, anyway, potentially a pretty powerful card because if this dies early and you're able to, you're able to just trade this off and get one of your, your early small minions turned into a 6-6, that can be a really powerful tempo play. So I think this card has some potential for sure. Next up we have a Necrotic Sphere, which is a 6-cost spell. Destroy all minions near your general and summon Wraithlings in their place. So this is obviously a very powerful spell. We've seen more, more and more of these powerful spell cards uh, in in Duelist, and I, I like this one. This is obviously, you know, a very strong effect uh, that is difficult to play around because if your opponent's trying to kill you, they're like getting their minions towards you and you're like, okay, I'll walk next to you and boom, sphere you. And six isn't really like out of range. You know, we saw a lot of the, a lot of the big spells uh, in the last expansion were all eight cost spells. And, you know, I was really excited about Sky Phalanx and it never really panned out. You know, it seemed like, oh, this is a great way to both fin finish the game and defend myself. But a little bit too expensive to, to really do the latter of those. And Necrotic Sphere, though, this is not out of range at all. This is definitely something that can come up sort of easily in the middle of a game that you, you know, your opponent is trying to beat you down with a couple of guys. And you're like, all right, well, kill them both and I get some Wraithlings. And that's real strong. So uh, I definitely think this card has some potential in controlling Abyssian decks. Uh, and uh, I expect it to see some play. And last up in Abyssian, but certainly not least... Perhaps the most awesome <laughs> is Grandmaster Variax. 7 cost 7-7 seven, seven. with opening gambit. Your Bloodborne spell costs 3 and is now awesome. So this either makes your Abyssal Scar become summon a 4-4 four, four Fiend on every friendly Shadow Creep. Like what? Make a bunch of Shadow Creep. End of the game. Boom! Just going to blow you up. Or Shadow Spawn with summon 2 Wraith Things nearby. All of your Wraith Things become Furious. Rawr. So this is just a really powerful card uh, in any game that you expect to go long. You know, this is, for those of you who may be coming from Hearthstone, this is kind of like a, a Justicar True Heart. You know, this is uh, a card that is going to make your Bloodborne spell win the game on its own uh, in any situation where your opponent isn't just blowing you up. You know, this is going to effectively uh, just give you a Bloodborne spell that that is going to win the game very, very quickly. So, uh you know, if you're looking to play a long game, you know, you expect your opponent to be playing very attrition-oriented decks, it's hard to beat this because, you know, you don't even have to, have to worry about drawing cards from your deck. This is just giving you an effect that you are going to have every single turn for the rest of the game no matter what. And that's super strong. So, uh, in a world that there's lots of those styles of decks, lots of attrition decks that are looking to play very long games, this card is awesome. I don't know that we live in that world. I don't know that even with, you know, the sort of cards from the new set that may be slowing things down, good for control decks, whatever. I don't think we're there yet, but uh, I hope we get there because Grandmaster Variax is awesome. Next up we have Magmar. Uh, Magmar, second most played uh, faction, but haven't really played a ton of Magmar in a while. I, I was really a fan of the Rebirth decks prior to the Rebirth change, but uh, Silver Elder, not what he used to be. But there's some cool cards in here, so let's take a look. Uh, Rancor, two cost minion. 1-3, whenever your general takes damage, this minion gains that much attack. This is real strong. You know, this is a cheap minion that can get really big really fast. Uh, if you, uh, you know, play this and, uh, you know, just punch your opponent, you've got a 3-3 three, three for 2. And that's pretty strong. So, uh, I think this definitely has a lot of potential. One of the places that Magmar has been weak is its early game minions. So, I think that this is a place where they can potentially uh, get a little bit of strength to go alongside the young Silithar. Next up, we have Entropic Gaze, which is deal four damage to the enemy general. Both players draw a card. And uh, one of the most played Magmar decks for me for a while has actually been Starhorn. Uh, since I sort of you know got off the uh, the Rebirth train, 
uh, the Starhorn, uh, whether it's the Vindicator or, you know, whatever else, just we both draw, things are growing, you're dying. And this is, you know, kind of an interesting card for that deck because it is a card that is going to be a burn spell when you want a burn spell. And it also grows your Vindicators and, and things like that. And if you have cards that, you know, are, are getting more benefits from this, I think it's what Decimus is the, uh, the legendary that your opponent takes damage every time they draw. You know, this just can pile on more and more and more damage. So uh, I definitely think this card has potential in those decks. And uh, you can just really, like, overload your opponent's hand very easily and just burn them out. So uh, I definitely like this card and expect that I'm going to be playing with it soon. Next up we have Thrax. I think that's it. Thrax. 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 I don't know. Anyway, 2-4 for 3, so not great. Uh, but with Blood Surge, all friendly minions gain plus 1 attack, including itself. So this is a card that uh, goes into the aggressive style of, uh, of Magmar decks, potentially the rush decks with Starhorn, just trying to play out a bunch of guys, swarming the board, uh, can work very well with, uh, what is, what's the one that summons a bunch of pets? Forget the name of it. The one that summons like four pets in, 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 a, in a, a, a quadrant or whatever. Anyway, powerful card if, you, uh, if you're able to, to get it going, just every time you Bloodborne spell, buffing your entire team. The first time, you know, if you play this guy in Bloodborne spell immediately, 3-4 for 3, pretty reasonable, and buffing the rest of your team, also quite strong. So it uh, does have potential for sure, and uh, definitely goes into a particular type of deck. Not the one that I've played the most, but we'll see. Uh, and next up, uh, another card kind of in the vein of Entropic Gaze, but souped up, Tectonic Spikes. Both players draw three cards, deal three damage to both generals. This is kind of a burst card with uh, the, uh, what is it, Decimus, as I said again, and Vindicator, uh, or the even bigger version of, of Vindicator whose name escapes him at the time. But, you know, this is a, a card that can, uh, you know, if you're playing a, uh, a deck that's going to punish your opponent for drawing, this is obviously very strong. And often you can also just, like, empty your hand and your opponent kind of has a lot of cards. And you play this, and you're just drawing three cards, and your opponent is overdrawing. And that's pretty, pretty insanely powerful because, you know, you're getting effectively a card draw and burn effect uh, while your opponent isn't even getting much of an advantage out of it. So... Very strong card that I expect to see uh, see play if that archetype does have uh, really any legs to it. And perhaps the strongest of the Magmar cards is Drogon. Someone's been watching Game of Thrones, I think. But uh, anyway, Blood Surge of double your general's attack this turn. Now, I've played some Vath decks, and Vath decks can get a lot of attack. Vath decks can just, you know, keep using Overload, keep pumping up. And, well, with Drogon, you just pump, raw, and then just punch your opponent in the face and they die. And uh, I think this card is likely to uh, revitalize the, uh, the use of the uh, Silhouette Tracer, the Teleport guy in, uh, in Magmar decks, because you can really just end up getting yourself in a position where you just play Drogon and you can just punch your opponent for lethal in one turn. Not that, not that you know, far-fetched. You can play tons of defense and just look to you know, build up your general's attack and explode your opponent. And that's very effective. You, you know, there's lots of weapons you can use to do it. You can play Adamantite Claws, and you can get to lethal range uh, very, very quickly. And if, if your opponent isn't able to maneuver away from you, then they're just going to die. And Silhouette Tracer, allowing you to teleport, can really, you know, catch your opponent by surprise and uh, give you that window to Drogon and punch them for lethal. So I think this is a very powerful card, and I think you'll see a lot of play. Next up, we have one of the weirdest cards uh, in the expansion, which is Valknu Seal which is uh, summon an egg that hatches into a copy of a general. So you can hatch yourself a 225, and uh, kind of like the, the, what is it, Grandmaster Zier uh, in Lionar, giving you a second general. I'm not really, you know, I don't really know exactly how this works. I haven't gotten any rulings on this or whatever. I don't know if, like, your general just kind of hangs out too and your opponent has to kill both of them. But either way, this is just a super cool card, you know. You force your opponent in a position where they need to deal with this or the game gets totally weird for them. They go from trying to, you know, trying to just kill one general to having to kill two. And that's uh, that's super sweet. So I don't know if this card will be good because obviously anything that just makes a zero one that can be, that can be you know, dispelled or whatever else, silenced and eh, killed super easily. It's a zero one. But super cool when it happens. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. And last up for the factions, but certainly not least, is Vanar. One thing that I have to say, I'm excited there's a Vespier here, um, though the Vespier being Myriad, which a Blood Surge of summon a random wall nearby, not really what I'm looking for in my Vespier decks, but it's certainly pretty cool. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of wall cards in here. There's the there's Myriad, there is the uh, Grandmaster Embla, 
with the opening gambit of su surround the enemy general with random walls, which is just kind of bizarre. You know, you it costs eight for a five five, which seems kind of overcosted in terms of even this effect surround them with walls. But getting a bunch of walls and then having potentially the boost your walls card, I forget what that one's exactly called, the the big spell from uh, from the uh, the last expansion. Seems kind of cool, at least. Uh, I'm excited to see, you know, maybe there's just more tools you can use uh, to try and make that kind of deck work. Not really sure it is, uh, it's gonna gonna really pan out, but I do like the idea of uh, Vanar Control. I like Crystal Wisp, you know, with the uh, the the Dying Wish, you know, give you uh, an extra extra uh, mana crystal. It's a card that I've really wanted to find a way to actually play in a deck, and maybe you know, with Grandmaster Embla, with Myriad, with Frigid Corona, you know, one of the new cards that can just stun enemy, draw a card. It would just delay the game and eventually sort of build up these resources and build up these walls and win the game. So uh, I'm not sure if it's there, but uh, I, I definitely like that there are new tools to try and build that kind of deck. Uh, also, uh, other exciting cards are Enfeeble, three cost, all minions become 1-1. One, one. And this is, you know, kind of an interesting card. <clears throat> Obviously, if you're playing uh, against an aggressive deck, not really going to do much. Your opponent's minions are already generally kind of small, and paying uh, paying three to make them one one isn't super strong. But if you are playing against a deck that's playing a bunch of big things, well, you're playing Vanar, and you probably already have a lot of ways to deal with those big things because Aspect the Fox, you know, your ability to bounce them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> so this feels like kind of more of the same of what uh, Vanar already has. So I'm not super excited about it, but it could offer another dimension to really be like sort of an AOE effect. Cause that's something that Vanar has not really had, uh, is the ability to deal with a bunch of stuff. And in Feeble, uh, particularly in combination with, you know, well, anything, <laughs> can give you the ability to uh, to deal with those larger boards of stuff. So, uh, you know, another tool that might work in those control decks that I'm excited to see. One weird card in Vanar that can work in control, maybe works in, uh, in aggressive decks that are looking to punch away, Concealing Shroud. It's a bizarre card. You know, your general takes no damage until your next turn. This is kind of like just, you're buying a little bit of time. You're not even protecting your minions. It's not like it protects your, your other stuff. It just protects your general until your next turn. And this is, if your opponent's like building toward a combo turn, but you're also building toward a combo turn, you know, maybe this is a powerful card for that kind of situation. Uh, it does give you the ability to have like a window that you can ensure that you just can't lose the game this turn. And you can go ahead and punch your opponent's minions or punch your opponent in, in the face. Maybe it's useful in those kind of decks. I don't really know, but definitely an interesting card. And these sort of cards existing, I think is an interesting puzzle for players to solve. I don't know what to do with this one, but uh, I'm sure there's something cool to do with it. Uh, but what I think the most powerful of the Vanar cards uh, is the Sleet Dasher. It's a three, six for four, which is tough to kill just straight up. Uh, and whenever it destroys an enemy, reactivate it. So if you're able to buff this at all, uh, this can be like just super, super strong. Just mow through multiple opposing uh, opposing units. You can just play this off of a mana spring early in the game and then just eat your opponent's guy, move over, eat their other guy, move over, eat their other guy. It's just like hugely powerful dealing with uh, whether it's swarms of, say, Wraithlings or just even just like two threes. You know, this sort of standard two drop in Duelist, this can eat three of them before it dies. And that's like really, really powerful. That's to say nothing of whether you heal it or buff it or anything else. So Sleet Dasher is definitely a Vanar card that I am looking forward to uh, to playing with and I think is very powerful. And last but not least, the neutral cards. These are uh, not as exciting by and large as the faction cards as generally they shouldn't be. You want, to, you want the excitement to be in the cards that people uh, have to choose sides to play with, but Cryptographer, it is opening gambit, refresh your Bloodborne spell. This is kind of an interesting card, especially with the cards that buff your Bloodborne spell. You know, I want to see a Abyssian deck that uses a uh, Cryptographer and just the uh, the Grandmaster that makes your Bloodborne spell awesome and just keeps going, making you know more and more and more sweet, awesome Bloodborne effects. Not so exciting otherwise, but definitely cool there. Sanguinar, your Bloodborne spell costs one less to activate, four costs five, four. It's definitely an interesting card if you are playing with uh, cards that care about using your Bloodborne spell. This allows you to curve into, uh, say, something with Blood Surge uh, on curve and use it immediately, which could give you, you know, a pretty significant advantage in the right circumstances. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly which cards you might want to use it with, but uh, definitely worth looking out for uh, in the appropriate context. And last but not least is Meltdown, which is a seven cost seven seven legendary. The Blood Surge deals seven damage to a random enemy. And uh, this is, you know, kind of an interesting card if you, say, are playing with 
Cryptographer, Sanguinar. Oh, we're just gonna go off, just keep blood surging. Blow you up. I like it, but probably not a, uh, a super powerful finisher. You know, we, we have a lot more powerful things that do exist, but it is worth noting, as sort of I was saying earlier about uh, some of the other other legendary cards, the fact that it does have an impact the turn you play it, it you know, can be a big deal. Like if your opponent is low in life and has, you know, one medium to big minion, and you play Meltdown and use your, uh, use your Bloodborne spell, it's doing a lot of damage to them or killing their guy, and either one of those can be very powerful. So it, it might be a card that like kind of just looks like it's this weird finisher, but can also be sort of a control card because the fact that it's a random enemy can kill your opponent's minions, and uh, as long as they're not playing like a swarm deck, that can be really, really strong. So definitely does have more potential, I think, than it looks like on the surface, and uh, could be uh, kind of a sleeper of the set. So anyway, that's all my thoughts on the new Rise of the Bloodborne cards. Like I said, have not had a chance to play them yet, but I'm very much looking forward to doing so, and uh, I'm going to be heading and doing that very, very soon. So hope you guys are enjoying the set if you had a chance to play so far. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think of the new Rise of the Bloodborne cards in the comments, and I'll see you next time.